Hi, I'm Anthony, and I work as application support for NISI, uh, New Zealand e Science Infrastructure. And this is a recording of our standard uh, introduction to HPC workshop that we run regularly. Uh, if you'd like to attend one of these workshops in person, please, please feel free to contact us at support at nisi.org.nz. We're happy to set one of those up with you. So a little bit of background about who we are as an organization. As I said, NISI stands for New Zealand eScience Infrastructure. The main thing that we do as an organization is we maintain New Zealand's national high-performance computing infrastructure, uh, the HPCs. Uh, you can see what HPCs we maintain currently on the right there, uh, Maui and Mahawika. These are our high-performance computers or supercomputers or clusters. Um, we will go into a bit more detail about them later. Uh, but as I said, the main thing we do is maintain these uh, resources as accessible to New Zealand researchers. Um, in addition to this, uh, we also have a consultancy service. Um, and so for most of our users' problems, uh, our standard uh, support team is happy and able to help. Uh, we'll help you get your software up and running, help you get your jobs running. Um, if you're having any problems or getting any errors, we're happy to do our best to help you up there. Uh, but sometimes our users have more in-depth computational problems and questions, and that's where our consultancy team comes in. And so they're a team of scientific programmers. And so they will work with uh, your team to help you uh, improve your uh, software, your code. Uh, they're especially helpful for people writing their own code. Uh, they'll do things like help you uh, find ways to parallelize parts of your code to be able to utilize the extra resources or utilize GPUs or help you find ways to rewrite parts of your code to improve the performance, uh, such as rewriting parts of your code to low level compiled languages or finding uh, better functions to use for the same tasks. In addition to this consultancy service, uh, we are also heavily involved in training. So we run these regular workshops um, every week that there's interest. Um, as well as uh, involved in other training opportunities, uh, such as running regular webinars on various topics. Um, most of them about HPC related things, but not just HPC, just sometimes general computing skills as well. Uh, we're involved with various uh, groups to help run some of their uh, HPC related training. Um, such as Genomics Aotearoa, who we help run things like the uh, summer school and spring school. Uh, and in addition to this, we're also involved with the Carpentries Group um, to uh, help run carpentries all around New Zealand with various groups, software carpentry, data carpentry, which is not just HPC skills, but also just general computing skills. And finally, the other core service that we have um, is we are involved with uh, RIANS and Globus to maintain the Globus network in New Zealand. And this is a great tool and resource for users uh, on the HPC who have large amounts of data or data security concerns or data connection or connectivity issues that mean it's hard to transfer data through standard means. Um, and we help maintain that and you can get very high speed, very high security data transfer from the platforms via Globus. Uh, we do our best to support researchers from across disciplines all the way from biology, to mathematics, and even some social sciences projects. Um, on our team, we have a lot of people with different uh, backgrounds, including um, biology and physics and engineering. Um, and so hopefully, if you're having any kind of problems or questions, we might have someone on our team who can uh, help you out and offer some more in-depth advice on your problem. As an organization, uh, we are uh, funded through our collaborating institutions, those being uh, the University of Auckland, NIWA, uh, the University of Otago, Manaki Fenua, and MB. If you're at one of these collaborating institutions, you gain potentially free access from the collaborator pool, um, subject to some internal rules at your own institution. Uh, if you're not at one of these collaborating institutions, you can still be eligible for free access, uh, either by being a postgraduate uh, student at a New Zealand tertiary institution, you can get free access via the postgraduate uh, pool in that case or by having your research being funded by a national uh, contestable peer review uh, grant or contract um, in New Zealand. You can also get free access via the merit pool. If you are not eligible under any of those circumstances, you will need to purchase a subscription. Um, but for all new users, we do offer the opportunities for um, 
small uh, free early allocations to be able to get started and test the platform. So um, you don't have to spend money just to try it out if you're not eligible for one of those other three uh, free portals. Uh, this is just an image of our team. Um, I'm just showing this because uh, we are located across New Zealand uh, in four of the major cities, Auckland, Wellington, Christchurch, and Dunedin. Um, and we're happy to uh, support you wherever you are in New Zealand uh, via email or via Zoom meeting. But if you're at one of those four uh, physical sites and you're able to get to one of our locations, uh, we're also happy to set up in-person meetings uh, to discuss uh, any problems that you might be having and help you out. So what exactly is high performance computing and how is it different from standard computing? So there's the obvious difference, uh, which I'm sure you're aware of, which is just the scale. Uh, your standard laptop or desktop might be a dual core or quad core with uh, four, eight or 16 or even 32 gigabytes of RAM now they, these days. Um, our high performance computers are, are made up of what are called nodes. And so a single node is essentially its own computer, um, the way you think of it. Um, and our nodes on our platforms are uh, 36 or 40 CPUs. In general, there's some outliers, but those are the standard size, and they each have about 100 gigabytes of RAM. And so uh, even a single node compared to a standard computer is much larger. Um, but in addition to this, uh, our high performance computers are connected to each other via an interconnect. And so this interconnect is a uh, much, much faster than if you just plugged a whole lot of computers together with the internet cables. And so this is another major difference between high performance computers and standard computers is that the connection between the nodes, the hosts, the C computers, is much more performant uh, in communication than if you just plugged a whole lot of computers together. Um, another major difference between standard computing and high performance computing is uh, the fact that the software and hardware infrastructure of our high performance computers is purpose built to be able to take advantage of uh, running parallel code. So utilizing all the extra CPUs and many other re uh, resources available. And so what this means is that if you're doing any kind of work that's able to utilize uh, multiple CPUs, you'll generally find it runs more performant on the high performance computers than on your local machine. So what resources do we have exactly? Um, as I mentioned, we have two high-performance computers, uh, Maui and Mahawika. Uh, of these two, Mahawika is our general machine, which most projects will end up on. This is most likely the platform that you're going to end up on if you get an, uh, an allocation with us, project with us. It's got about 8,000 CPU cores at the time of this recording. Um, a standard, and about that's spread across 200 additional nodes. So a standard node on Mahawika is 36 CPUs and three gigabytes of memory per CPU, so about 100 gigabytes of memory per node. In addition to these standard nodes, there are some non-standard nodes which have 480 gigabytes of memory, as well as two 1.5 terabyte memory nodes, a four terabyte memory node, and a six terabyte memory node. And in addition to this, we have some uh, several GPU and auxiliary nodes, which include uh, some Tesla P100s and some A100 nodes, uh, which are quite new at the time of this recording. Uh, one of the major reasons most projects will end up on Mahawika is because Mahawika also has less restrictions in place in Maui. And so on Mahawika, you're able to submit jobs of pretty much any type. You can run serial jobs, or you can run uh, multi-CPU jobs spread across multiple nodes or full node jobs, um, up to hundreds of CPUs um, and terabytes of memory, as well as running jobs for up to three weeks. Maui, on the other hand, um, is our supercomputer. In practice, it's uh, got about 18,000 cores uh, spread across about 450 nodes. A standard node on Maui is 40 CPUs, and it's split between either 90 or 180 gigabytes of memory. There are some ancillary nodes as well that you can get access to uh, with some large amounts of, larger amounts of memory, 480 gigabytes of memory, or some GPUs. Uh, in Tesla P100s. However, if you're going to be doing any significant amount of work on those ancillary nodes, we'll generally grant an allocation on Mahawika instead, or as well in the case you do need an allocation on both. Now, Maui is built in mind with running very large, um, highly parallel types of code. 
So work that requires multiple nodes and works across multiple nodes using potentially hundreds uh, or even thousands of CPUs. Um, and so what this means is that we put some more restriction in place on Maui to make it easier to run these types of workloads. And so on Maui, unlike the Mahuika, you are restricted to only running full node jobs. So you cannot request a, a serial job except on some of the ancillary nodes. Um, but generally you can't request full no, uh, anything, le anything less than full node jobs. Um, and so if your work can't be divided into full nodes, full Maui nodes, which are 40 CPUs each, so 40, 80, 120, et cetera, CPU requirements, it's probably more suitable to run on Mahawika. Uh, in addition to this, there is a 24 hour wall time limit on Maui, um, which means that your job either, uh, your job has to either finish within 24 hours or you need to checkpoint your job in such a way that it finishes after 24 hours and can restart and continue on from where it left off. Now these restrictions in place are made to make it easier for those very large, uh, highly parallel jobs to, to queue on Maui. Uh, because if you think about Mahawika, where you can run a single CPU job or 10 CPU job or spread your CPUs across all the nodes, uh, and you can run it for three weeks long. If you want to run a very large job, generally you're going to want to run it on as few nodes as possible because there are communication overheads for running across nodes. And so running on fewer nodes will make a job more performant. And so the resources you need for your large job might be technically available on Mahawika, but they generally won't be available on as few nodes as possible because one node might have one CPU being used by this three week long job and other nodes got a few CPUs being used by these other jobs, et cetera, et cetera. And so there might be more than enough CPUs for your job to run, but if you want to enforce it only using as few nodes as possible, uh, you're gonna have to wait much longer in the queue for those nodes to free up entirely. By having the restrictions of only uh, full node jobs on Maui and 24 hour full time limits, uh, what this means is that we cycle through all the nodes within 24 hours in the Maui, so they free up uh, faster, so high priority jobs can get up and running faster. Uh, and by being full nodes, you never have to worry about a situation where there's enough CPUs available for your job, uh, but because they're spread across multiple nodes, you're gonna have to wait longer and it reduces the amount of wastage in that case when, when it comes to queuing very large jobs. And so all of this means that Maui jobs, um, if you're trying to run very large jobs, they tend to queue faster and run faster on Maui. Uh, on top of this, Maui has a faster interconnect and faster CPU, so uh, jobs will be more performant in general on Maui, though it's faster read write on Mahawika. Um, well, some jobs will be better performant on Mahawika, um, but it means that if you're doing those very large API or very large highly parallel type jobs, Maui is generally the best suited platform. Between them, you can see the storage. Uh, Maui and Mahawika have a shared storage system between them. And so most of you will only have an allocation on either Mahawika or Maui, uh, but there will be a minority of project teams that have an allocation on both platforms because some of your work might be suitable for one platform or the other. Some of it might be suitable for the other. Uh, in the case that applies to you, uh, by having shared storage, it's very convenient because it means that anything you generate on Mahawika is accessible on Maui and vice versa because there's one shared storage system between them. Now, on to file transfer. Um, I won't go into detail about your logging configuration and setup in this uh, workshop, uh, but you can find instructions on that link there, uh, which go into more details because there are several options, well, several options if you're a Windows user. If you are a Mac or Linux user, there's only really one option, uh, but for Windows users, you have multiple options. And so I'll just go into some of the details of that file transfer for um, you, depending on what operating system you're using. So for Mac Linux, and those of you using the Ubuntu subsystem for Windows on a Windows machine, which is our most recommended SSH client for login configuration, uh, transferring files is relatively straightforward. Uh, in that login configuration, you will have set up an alias, uh, either Mahawika or Maui, or you'll set up with both, and depending on your platform, you will have an allocation on, you use the one that you have an allocation on, and that alias will be used in the commands. And so we can see, with this SCP command down here, we use SCP file name, then Mahawika colon, uh, and then the path to the uh, location of the file uh, we want to move the file to on Mahawika. And that will transfer uh, the file. Uh, the Mahawika alias can be interchanged with Maui. Uh, you'll, you'll use the 
alias for the platform that you have an allocation on, as I said. Transferring files from the platforms is just the reverse, essentially. So this would be the alias, in this case, Mahawika, colon, path to the file on the platform, and path to wherever you want to move it on your local machine, and that will transfer the file to your local machine in that location. Uh, for Windows users, there are a lot of other options as well, but I'm only going to the other most popular option. Um, if you're using a MobX term and have set up the MobX term configuration correctly, there will be an SCP session that appears on the left hand side, which, you can, uh, which is just a file explorer by the looks, and which you can just drag and drop uh, files into and out of. Uh, in addition to these means of file transfer, you can use Globus, as I mentioned before. So Globus is available for those. Um, to have large data sets or security concerns and connection consistency issues. It's a really great um, high speed data transfer network. Um, and you can get very high speeds if it's set up uh, correctly for your institution. And you can find more details of how to set that up at the um, link I've provided there. And finally, our clone is available um, on the platforms if you want to transfer data from storage services like Google Drive or OneDrive uh, more conveniently too. Now that you know how you'll be transferring data, uh, where exactly will you be transferring the data to? And so uh, once you've got your account, you will have a user account, which will by default have a home directory. If it's in the user account has a home directory, only accessible by you. Uh, that's found to slash home slash username. It's got a default disk space of 20 gigabytes and a default inode limit of 100,000 inodes. Now, inodes are essentially files. So that's a file limit essentially. Uh, but we don't really want you doing too much work in your home directory. Uh, it's mostly there for users who want to set their own aliases and shortcuts and stuff in their bash RC and bash profile, etc. And if you don't know how to do any of that, that's fine. It's just there available for those who know how to do these type of things and would like to set them up. Uh, you can do some basic tests and source some small things in your home directory, but generally what we want you to be doing most of your work in your project directory. So we don't increase your home directories just space by no order. Um, and so your project directories, uh, for each project you are a member of, you'll have access to two project directories. The first of these is your persistent project directory, which is found at slash messy slash project slash your project code. Uh, it has a default disk space of 100 gigabytes and a default inode limit of 100 of an aisle, not inodes in files. It is backed up uh, daily and you can find backups in the uh, hidden dot snapshots directory of uh, your project directory, as well as there's a dot snapshot structure in your home directory as well. Um, in addition to being backed up daily, it's persistent. So we won't go out of our way um, to automatically delete anything in your home or project directory. This is where you should be storing things like persistent data sets and outputs and stuff that you're working on as part of the project. Um, things that you will need semi-regularly um, to do your work on your project or expect to need to do it, use it again in the not too distant future, uh, as well as where you will be installing your software. Uh, pretty much everything else should be installed and, um, installed in your uh, no backup directory, stored in your no backup directory. Uh, and so this is found at slash messy slash no backup slash your project code. It's got a default disk space, 10 terabytes of default inode limit of a million inodes and inodes of files. Um, as the name suggests, it's not backed up. So if you delete something from no backup, it has a, it's probably gone. Um, if you do actually delete something important, no backup, do contact us. Sometimes we do take backups of no backup for various reasons, but don't get your folks up. That we will have a copy of it. In addition to not being backed up, uh, no backup is also not persistent in that files on the no backup will be auto automatically deleted after 120 days of the last access of those files. Um, this is generally where you'll be storing as I said, pretty much everything else. So intermediary files, outputs you don't necessarily need long term, or any data sets that are easy for you to re-upload or regenerate, or anything in general that's easy for you to re-upload or regenerate should be stored in your no backup directory. No backup is also uh, has a faster read write, faster file system than persistent. And so we do advise that if you are running your jobs, that you have a copy of the data that you're running on in no backup, uh, as if you've got read write intensive work, you might find that you get a performance increase by running from data stored in there and writing only to data 
into the no backup directory. For both the persistent and no backup, we do increase uh, the quotas of uh, disk space and nine nodes uh, at your request as necessary. But we may have a conversation with you about it to find out what you need. Um, you will want to keep track of your disk space and nine nodes quotas and usage of these directories. We don't have any kind of automatic system currently that will uh, tell you if you are. Uh, running out or have run out of disk space or inodes. And so we do advise, as I said, that you keep track of this. And you can do this with the command nn underscore storage underscore quota. And this will just give you a breakdown of your disk space and inode usage of all your directories. Um, in addition to these directories, we do have some longer term tape storage, which is available at your request um, called Nearline. And so if you would like to store more long term data that you don't necessarily need to have immediate access to, uh, but you may need access to later on, such as Maybe you only think you'll need the data uh, once you're in the publication phase and you're just getting a request back from your reviewers and stuff like that. Um, that's the type of data that you want to store in Nearline um, and we can make that available to you. Uh, there may be a lag time between being able to get access to that data depending on how busy it is. It's a queue based storage system. Um, but so long as you don't need immediate access to it, you should be able to get access to it well, relatively promptly. Now back a little bit to uh, my statements about the major differences between standard computing and high-performance computing. And another major difference between standard computing and high-performance computing is how you're like doing your work. So on your local machine, you're probably used to a, a heavily GUI-based environment where you uh, boot up your computer's operating system, your Windows, your Mac, your Linux. And it opens up with a GUI of the operating system. You navigate that GUI using the mouse to find maybe an icon on your desktop uh, for another piece of software that you want to use, double click it, open it up, then you can interactively run commands in there and that software will automatically, uh, as you run these commands, requisition resources from the operating system uh, to run those commands um, and then put them back when it's done. You can do this to a degree on the high performance computers. So on our login nodes, you're able to do these type of interactive jobs uh, and you can even use X forwarding to forward GUIs to your local machine. Uh, in addition to this, we also have uh, Jupyter Notebooks available uh, online where you can access the platform via the Jupyter Notebooks uh, via your browser and do some interactive and GUI-based work. However, most work won't be able to be done this way. You will be relatively limited in the amount of computational resources you're able to access by running jobs through this means. If you want to do anything computationally intensive, you're going to have to be putting what are called batch jobs or slurm jobs. And so on our system, we have a, a system called slurm, which is our queue, queuing system. And essentially, you will write a batch script, slurm script, which is a plain text file. We specify everything you want and everything you want to do. So for example, your plain text file might say, I want X amount of CPUs and Y amount of memory for Z amount of time. And then I want to run software A with script. Uh, I want to load software A and run script B with software A. That's your plain text files in the gist of it. Uh, and you'll submit that to our schedule. It goes into the queue. Uh, once it gets to the top of the queue, Slurm reads it, requisitions all the resources you specified for it, runs everything you told it to run, and then finishes and produces outputs um, based on what you've done inside the job, as well as just a general output file. That is the general means that 99% of all the work on the high performance computers uh, will be done. And it's uh, very different from what most of our users are, are used to. It's, it can take a little bit to get used to, um, but hopefully with this, uh, through this talk, it'll be a little less scary to you. And if you have any questions or problems, um, we're always happy to help. Um, and so we'll look at a few examples after, uh, uh, soon on how to do those. Before we do that, we'll take a look at some uh, slum commands. So, our HPC is a Linux system, and so you will be expected to have some basics of uh, units, uh, or shell, bash, whatever you want to call it. Um, I won't go into the details of specific bash commands here that you'll need to know, uh, but at the bottom of the page, you can find a link to our Slurm and Unix cheat sheets, uh, which you might find useful. And in addition, if you are a very new beginner to Unix, to shell command line, um, I'd highly advise taking a look at the software carpentry lessons available at the link provided at the bottom of the page as well. 
um, you don't need too much. You only need the very basics of uh, the Unix shell of things like file uh, navigation, uh, file and directory navigation, and creation and management. Um, and you can find those in the first three lessons on that software carpentry page, which is about 45 minutes. Um, but again, if you have any questions or problems, do contact us, we're always happy to help. Well, I will go into the details on some of these more important Slurm commands. And as I said, you can find more of both the Slurm and Unix commands that are important on the cheat sheets provided at the bottom of the page. So first of these commands is dispatch, probably the most important of the commands. Uh, this is how you submit your jobs to the queue, to the scheduler. So you've made your plain text file. In this case, we've called it example job.sl. The extension doesn't matter. I tend to add an extension .sl on my own Slurm slash bash scripts, just to make it easy to differentiate them, but it doesn't matter, you can call it whatever you want. And so example job.sl is a plain text file. And in it, as I said, it's got a script, plain text script that says, I want X amount of CPUs, Y amount of memory for Z amount of time, loading software A and then running script B with software A. At the base of it. And so you submit that to the schedule, it goes into the queue, et cetera, as I mentioned before. If you submit a job and you realize that you want it canceled, even if it's already running, you can use the command S cancel on the job ID to kill the job or remove it from the queue before it starts. And you can get the job ID either from either of the next two commands, SQ and S count, both of the column that says job ID. SQ, SQ by itself will show all the jobs that are in the queue on that platform, which is generally not particularly useful to our users. And so you'll want to use sq lowercase u followed by your username, uh, which will show you then only your own jobs that are running and in the queue on the platform. Once a job is finished, though, jobs are removed from sq. And so you can't use it to look back at historical jobs. You can only look at actively running or queued jobs uh, and allow you to see you know, the reason why that they're queued, such as resources or priority. The next command is S account, and S account, um, apart from S batch, is probably the most important command here. Um, S account by default, if you just type S account into your command line, will tell you all of your jobs that are uh, pending, running, or have run in the last day since midnight today. You can look at older jobs by using the flag dash capital S, so it's kept dash S followed by the month, year dash month dash day, and that will show you jobs since that date. And the reason this account is really important is because this account gives you information about the resource usage of your jobs after they have run. Uh, so the important columns are the elapsed, which is the elapsed time, how long the job ran for, the alloc, which is the number of logical CPU calls your job had. Um, I'll explain more details about the difference between logical CPU cores and real physical CPU cores a bit later. Um, but suffice to say for now, for every actual physical CPU core, there are two logical CPU cores. So I mentioned that the nodes on Mahawika generally have 36 CPU cores. They have 30 physical CPU cores, which is 72 logical CPU cores. And I'll explain that um, later, what I mean by that. Total CPU is the total amount of logical CPU time spent working on the job. And then the max RSS is the maximum memory used at any point during the job. And the reason these are important is because you want to have these usage data for your job so you can do something called job scaling. Now, I won't go into too much detail about it here. Um, I've provided a link on this page which goes into uh, much more detail, a better explanation about what job scaling is and how to do it. Uh, but essentially, um, as I mentioned when I talked about your slum scripts, you have to specify in advance the resources that your job needs. So you need X amount of uh, CPUs and Y amount of memory for that amount of time. If you ask for not enough memory or not enough time, um, your job will fail. You get a timeout memory er error or an uh, out of memory error. And depending on how your job set up, it'll either run slower or it'll fail itself. Um, and so you need to know in advance the resources that your job needs. But that's often difficult because uh, often our users are coming onto the high performance computers uh, with essentially only the knowledge that the job can't run on their local machine. So they know how big potentially their local machine is, but that's it. And they know it doesn't run on their local machine and they're just trying to get on something that they can run it on. And so that's where job scaling comes in. And so job scaling is you start off with a small scale job, ideally something that can run on your local machine, 
uh, by what I mean by small scale jobs is, for, set, uh, for example, a subset of data. So if you have a data set with a million columns and rows, you might only use, you know, 1,000 or 10,000 rows or something like that. And so it's a subset of data, a much smaller subset of the data that you can run your script, your analysis on. And as I said, hopefully that subset, that uh, small scale job runs on your local machine. And so then you have a starting point. You know how much resources your local machine has. And so you can then try and run that on the high performance computers using the resources that you have in your local machine. And then you use this account to see how much resources the job used. And then you can start scaling up the job. And so you scale that up in the side of the data. So you take a few data points. So maybe you have from your original million by million uh, data set, you take a a million by a thousand and then a million by 10,000 and a million by 20,000, a million by 30,000 or something. You have a few data points and then you run all of those and you see how they compare. And you do the same uh, by increasing the number of CPUs and seeing how the performance changes uh, when you increase the number of CPUs. And so you expect when you run your parallel code, adding more CPUs speeds it up, but it probably won't speed it up in the middle. Uh, in addition to speeding it up, it's probably going to increase or potentially could increase the amount of memory that you've got required. And so you'll want to keep track of both the, the runtime and the memory usage of your jobs as you scale up both the size of the data and uh, the number of CPUs your job has. And so you'll do a few scaling tests like this. And as I said, you go into more detail on that support page, but essentially what you're doing this for is to find an optimal amount of CPUs for your job and the op and how and extrapolate out the memory requirements and wall time requirements of your full-size job with the optimal amount of CPUs. That way, you have a relatively good estimation of the resource requirements of your full-size job before you submit it. You don't have to worry about, or you'll have to worry less about the possibility of your job either asking for not enough resources and failing because it ran out of time or ran out of memory, or asking for too much resources and it queuing for much longer because you're asking for a lot of resources you don't need and then potentially wasting those resources depending on what they are. And so scaling is a really important thing that you want to do and I highly advise taking a look at the support page a bit more in depth. Uh, the final command I'll mention isn't actually a sample, it's one of the ones we created, but it is a very useful one, uh, NN underscore para underscore usage, um, followed by your project code. And that'll just give you a breakdown of your usage history for the last year on your project. Um, on a monthly breakdown, which is just convenient for keeping track of those things. Finally, I'll mention for those of you who uh, don't have a lot of experience using Unix, uh, the man command is a fantastic command. You can use it on pretty much anything or any command. Uh, man stands for manual. Put it in front of SBatch in this case, man SBatch, and it'll give you uh, the manual for that command and show you all the various different options and stuff available for that command and how to use it. So now we'll look at some examples. So all of these examples, uh, they are on Mahawika, um, but they do all work on Maui. Uh, I just use them on Mahawika because it was convenient when I was setting up these test jobs. So this is, as I mentioned, that plain text file, that Ash script, that Slam script, that is what you submit to the scheduler, um, telling it what to do to set up your job and run it. And so the, the first line, the top line, uh, hash, uh, hash, exclamation slash bin slash bash dash e. Uh, you don't have to worry about too much. It's essentially specifying the language. Uh, just make sure it's at the top of all of your slam scripts. These next three lines, they all start with this hash sbatch. And so this is to indicate that they are sbatch directives and they are used in the slam job to set up your job. And so bash dash job name sets up what the job name is. And so when you look in your in the queue, either with SQ or S account or in historical jobs, that's what it'll be called. Uh, you will want to make them named meaningfully because you will often want to look back at historical jobs. And if you name all your jobs meaningfully, it'll make it easier for you to look back and figure out what job is what. The next line, dash dash time uh, equals zero, zero, colon, zero, zero, one, colon, zero, zero. That's in units of hours, minutes, uh, seconds. So that's one minute job. And that's how much more time we want for our job. That's the maximum amount of time that this job will run for. And if it hits that one minute wall time limit, uh, it will fail. So true, do try to be accurate with that, that request as well. A good rule of thumb is to ask for maybe 20% more wall time than you're expecting to need. Uh, the next line, dash dash mem equals 3000. Uh, 
This is the memory of the job in megabytes. So we're asking for 3000 megabytes and we'll be given 3000 megabytes of memory on this job. We haven't specified a number of CPUs and so we're going to default to uh, only one physical CPU, which is two logical CPUs. And so this job, uh, when it gets in the queue, we'll get, uh, when it gets to the queue, it's gonna get one physical CPU, 3000 megabytes of memory and have those resources for one minute. And then it's gonna run through everything we've told it to all the commands we've told. In this case, the only command we've told it to do is run pwd, uh, which is a basic unit command that just prints the working directory. And so when we look at the output file, we can see it's printed the working directory. And that's just a, a very basic serial job, but we'll base all the other scripts on this basic serial job. But as I said, like that's a serial job, um, but generally if you're coming onto the high performance computers, you wanna do some form of parallelization. And so most or well, many scientific softwares are able to utilize different forms of parallelization and we'll look at some of the, uh, the means by which this can be done uh, over the coming slides. On the platforms, the three main types of parallelization you'll see are multi-thread, it's open MP example, uh, distributed or MPI, and then uh, independent jobs and job arrays. So job arrays aren't really a form of parallelization. Uh, or way of conveniently doing the same thing lots and lots of times. I'll go into more detail about it later. Um, but it is tangentially related and it is very useful. So let's take a look at the first type of parallelization, uh, multi-threading. So multi-threading is a method of parallelization. We have a master thread that forks off into a specified number of slave threads. And the master thread will then divide all the work to tasks for each of these slave threads and itself. They'll each run uh, independently on their own CPU, uh, but they will be in a shared memory environment on the same node. And so they're able to communicate to each other via that shared memory environment and they're able to read and write to the same things. And so each of them have their own tasks. And as you can see from the little diagram at the bottom there, um, master thread splits off, they all do their own things. And then they come together for a serial portion on the master thread again, on the master CPU, where the master thread will then potentially break up the work further, uh, available to more or less of the same amount of CPUs and phase rates, they'll all do their own thing and so on and so forth until the job is done. Multi-threading allows you to utilize multiple CPUs um, on a single node, uh, but it does require those CPUs to be on a single node in a shared memory environment. And so it has the upside of, because it's a shared memory environment, if you have large data sets, uh, for example, you only need to uh, read that data into memory once, However, the downside is that you can only utilize as many CPUs as there are available on that single node, at least with multi-threading alone. And so if your work is very CPU bound, uh, you might find yourself uh, being limited in that fashion and you might want to use another form of parallelization. And so now looking at the example script, um, again, pretty much all the same as our serial script. The difference is here is we've added the extra line dash dash CPUs per task equals four. And so this is the number of logical CPUs per task, the number of logical CPUs in a shared memory environment on our job. So we're gonna get four logical CPUs. Which as I mentioned, there are two logical CPUs for each physical CPU. So this is two physical CPUs. Uh, the command, you don't need to worry about it at all. It's just there to show you with this output here, uh, it prints the affinity list. And the affinity list refers to the uh, logical CPUs or CPUs available on that node. And so we can see that we have access to four of the CPUs on that node, CPUs 7, 9, 43, and 45. Um, how you will utilize getting access to those extra CPUs is dependent on the software that you're using. Some software will be able to do it automatically, able to detect that you've got these extra CPUs available and be able to utilize them. Um, some software you'll need to use uh, specific commands that are able to utilize it. Um, and another software, especially the close, the lower, more low level compiled you get. So if you get to Python or if you go down to C or something like that, uh, you have to be very explicit and you essentially have to tell it, um, every CPU what they want, what you want it to do. And that's all dependent on what software you're using though. And so I won't go into detail on how, about how to do that there because it varies. And so that's multi-threading. Um, but as I mentioned, you're limited to a single node there. And so if your work is very CPU bound, Multi-threading alone is generally not the type of parallelization you want to use. And that's where um, MPI or distributed program comes in. So MPI stands for message passing interface and it's a communication protocol for programming across parallel computers. So communicating not just within a node but across nodes via the interconnect. This parallelization allows you to utilize many, many more CPUs across multiple nodes as well as their memory. 
And so you can potentially get access to thousands, whereas multi-threading, our standard nodes are only 36 or 40 CPUs generally, and so you're only limited to that many CPUs. With MPI, you could get access to hundreds of thousands of CPUs potentially, which for various CPU bound work uh, is a massive boom. Now, MPI has some upsides and downsides to this. Um, the communication across nodes via MPI is less performant than the communication within nodes via multi-threading. And so if you only need the amount of CPUs available on a single node, you'll probably be better off performance-wise running on a single node than using MPI across nodes. And because you're communicating across multiple nodes, uh, at least once on each node, uh, data will be read, read, read into memory. So it means you're going to have to read things into memory multiple times, which means you potentially need to use a lot more memory than you would uh, if you were just doing a single node, even for the same size data set. But the, other thing, the big upside is that access to all those extra CPUs means you can often get uh, uh, CPU bound work done much, much, much faster. And so here is an MPI example. Made a few changes here. Uh, the major change, the biggest change is we've added the extra line dash dash n task equals two. This refers to the MPI tasks. And so we have two MPI tasks here. Uh, if you remember from the previous slide, we use CPUs per task. That task is the same, so that's MPI task. Because we haven't specified a number of MPI tasks, we only get one, so it's just a non-MPI job, but with this job, we've specified two MPI tasks, so it's an MPI job with two tasks. Each of these tasks will get how much how many CPUs we specify. So we haven't specified a number of CPUs here, so it defaults to one physical CPU, which is two logical CPUs. So we're going to get four logical CPUs for this job, split across the two tasks. Another change we made is that we're no longer requesting memory with just dash dash mem. We're using dash dash mem per CPU. And the reason we're using dash dash mem per CPU is because we, unless we force a certain number of tasks into each node, we don't necessarily know how many tasks are going to be on each node. And dash dash mem in reality refers to the memory per node. And so if we have our two task job and we use dash dash mem, if both of our tasks ended up on separate nodes, each task would get however much memory we specify with dash dash mem. If both our tasks ended up on the same node, they'll still only get that amount of memory between them. And so uh, MPI jobs are linearly with memory, relatively linearly with memory requirements. And so this means that if you uh, don't know how many tasks are going to end on a node, because you're not forcing a certain amount of tasks on a node, which you can do, um, you can often end up running out of memory if more tasks than you're expecting end up running on the same node. And so that's where mem per CPU comes in. Uh, rather than just giving a certain amount of memory to each node, it counts how many CPUs, logical CPUs, are available on each node, and it gives memory relative to that. So if both our tasks end up on different nodes, each node has two CPUs, two logical CPUs from each from the single task on it, so they will each get 3,000 megabytes of memory. If they end up on the same node, that one node will then have four logical CPUs from the two tasks, and it'll get 6,000 megabytes of memory. And so that means that the memory will scale uh, with the amount of CPUs on the node, meaning you're going to avoid risking your job running out of memory by having an unexpectedly large amount of, of uh, tasks run on the same node. And the final difference is that we've got in front of our command this srun command. And so this is really important because srun essentially tells it to execute across the tasks. If we had just run pwd, we'd print out the working directory once, but by running srun, we uh, have it so that it runs in every single task, uh, which means we get the working directory printed twice in our output file. Um, similarly to with the multi-threaded job, um, what you have to do to utilize these extra CPUs, these extra MPI tasks, is different based on the software you're using. Um, and it will either be done automatically all the way to you having to be manually specifying where data goes and what tasks each of these MPI tasks needs to do. And it will be different based on your software. And so I've talked about logical CPUs and physical CPUs a little bit now. Um, and so now I'll explain what the difference is and why there is this difference. And it all comes down to something called hyperthreading being enabled on the platforms. And so the easiest way to explain hyperthreading is by using an example. Let's say that you have a 
two physical CPU computer, just a standard two core computer, what you're used to thinking of as a, a dual core computer, right? Now, if you wanted to run a multi-thread job on that dual core computer, generally what you would do is you'd run one thread on each of these CPUs. So each CPU would get one thread. But the thing is that these threads can stall. They can stall for various reasons. Maybe they're waiting on something to be read into memory, or maybe they're waiting on the other one of the other threads to finish some calculation, any number of reasons. But the point is that threads can stall. And if a thread stalls in this case, then the CPU that that thread is sitting on is idle. That's just wasted CPU time. And we don't really want wasted CPU time. And so one right way around this is that you can assign a greater number of CPUs to a lesser number, or a greater number of threads to a lesser number of CPUs. So oversubscribe your CPUs, essentially. And now what will happen is if a thread is running on a CPU, but the thread stalls for some reason, now instead of the CPU also being idle and installed, the CPU will kick the old thread off and load one of the other threads on. This, uh, this means that you don't have that wasted stall time. Of that thread because now the new thread's loaded on and it can run through its task until it stalls and gets kicked off another thread comes on and so this can potentially increase the performance of your code potentially quite significantly if you've got long enough stall times however there are downsides to this in the fact that the cpu has no way of knowing how long stall time is going to be in advance all it knows is that the, that the thread is stalled and it gets it off and what can happen is that often there are very very short stall times and that kicking a thread off and loading a new thread on is not computationally for free. So there are overheads to switching threads. And if the stall times are short enough, the cost of switching threads can be greater than the uh, benefit of not having stall times. And so your jobs can actually potentially run slower by assigning a greater number of threads to a few number of CPUs. And so that's where hyperthreading comes in. So hyperthreading is a software and a hardware solution to this problem. Our CPU can still only do the same amount of calculation as a standard CPU. But our CPUs have two hardware threads on them when a standard CPU only has one hardware thread. And so we can assign two threads to each of our CPUs. And while one thread is running, the other one sits on the idle hardware thread. And now, when the thread that's running stalls on the CPU, rather than having to kick the thread off and load a new thread on, it can switch very, very quickly, almost instantaneously to the other hardware thread and start running that other hardware thread. And so by having two hardware threads on each of our CPUs, we get um, most of the benefit, or all of the benefit from having multiple threads assigned to a, a lesser number of CPUs. And we avoid most of the downside potential of if you have short stall times causing great overheads from switching threads. But the thing is, Slurm doesn't really understand hyperthreading, and the way to implement hyperthreading, the only way you can do it is by essentially telling Slurm that the hardware threads are CPUs. And so that's what we've done. Our system has, uh, each CPU has two hardware threads on it, and Slurm sees those two hardware threads on each of our CPUs and says that's a CPU. And so it thinks that each CPU has two CPUs sitting on it. Each actual CPU has two CPUs sitting on it. Um, and so that's why we've got these logical CPUs, which are the hardware threads, and these physical CPUs, which are the actual CPUs themselves. Now, you can disable hyperthreading, and we do advise you test it both with it enabled and disabled. We have found that some folks do get performance increased by having hyperthreading um, enabled. And so the default is to have it enabled, and so try to disable it performance improves. It's especially common for engineering code, we found that they have a performance decrease with hyperthreading. Do test it. But while you're doing the testing, you need to be aware um, that well, in member CPU will always refer to the uh, the logical CPU hardware thread. If you're using member CPU in an MPI job, for example, if you disable hyperthreading, CPUs per task will stop referring to logic CPUs and start referring to physical CPUs. And it's just something you have to be aware of, that, that annoying inconsistency. So I talked earlier when I talked about S encounters that you'd want to do these scaling tests. And uh, the big reason why you want to do those scaling tests that I mentioned earlier is because of scaling behavior. It's the fact that almost no parallel work 
will scale perfectly linearly. With the exception of stuff that's not really, really parallel, which is embarrassingly parallel stuff, if it's known, but essentially when you just need to run the same thing um, many, many times, and you can divide the problem um, as many as times as you want and solve them all independently. With that exception, pretty much all the work, all the parallel work you're going to be running on the platforms, it's going to scale non-linearly. So that means that if your data is, say, 10 times bigger than your test tool, it's probably not going to take just 10 times longer to run. And if you double the number of CPUs, the job's probably not going to run twice as fast. And so you need to be aware of the scaling behavior and that you do those scaling tests um, because of this. And so we'll take a look at a couple of the major reasons why the scaling behavior occurs. There's just two of them. There are a lot more. Um, but here are just two of the examples. The first of these is something called Amdo's law. And it refers to the fact that every single parallel job has a serial portion. There's no such thing as a purely, purely parallel job. And so even if you could theoretically have perfect parallelization on the parallel parts of your code, which you won't because there are other reasons for nonlinear scaling um, in parallel portions of your code, but even if hypothetically you could, you will not get perfect scaling for your job because the serial portion of your job will be unaffected by the extra CPUs. And so as you increase the number of CPUs, you might proportionally speed up the parallel portions of your code, code but the serial portions of your code remain unchanged at best, and sometimes they'll even slow down. And so as you speed up the parallel portion of your code, the serial portion becomes a larger and larger proportion of the runtime until eventually it makes up most of the runtime and you're getting less and less return on investment, so to speak, for adding some CPUs. If you get to a point where you've added enough CPUs that it's a 24 hour job and only one hour of it is parallel and the 23 hours of serial, double the CPUs, now that one hour takes half an hour, but the 23 hours can take 23 hours. And you're now doubled the CPUs, doubled the resources you asked for to get a speed up of 24 hours to 23 and a half hours, which isn't very efficient. There's no hard and set rule of how efficient your job needs to be because there's no job more efficient than a serial job. We understand this. We don't expect your jobs to be perfectly efficient. Um, we just ask you to be considerate. Uh, if your job needs to run faster, it needs to run faster. But if your job can ask for less resources and maybe run for a bit longer, uh, do try doing that because it will be more efficient. The other major type, the other major reason for nonlinear scaling that I'll talk about here is the fact that there are communication overheads. And this is especially true for MPI, but it remains true for multi threading as well. Um, but uh, essentially, the more CPUs you add per job, the more communication costs there are for those CPUs. And in this MPI job, for example, if someone's actually worked on our old platform pan, they were adding more and more CPUs, and they eventually got to a point where increasing the number of CPUs not only didn't give them any extra speed up, but actually slowed the job down. And this comes to the fact that the communication between those CPUs isn't free, and they got to a point where every CPU that they added incurred greater costs for communication between those CPUs than they got from having the extra CPU. And so for these reasons, and many more, because these are only two examples, you want to do that scaling test that I talked about earlier to try and extrapolate out the resource requirement to your job. Now we'll take a look at the uh, final type of parallelization, which isn't really parallelization. Uh, this is job races, independent jobs. It's essentially just, as I said, a way of submitting the same thing lots and lots of times. So, so uh, simulations and permutation analysis and stuff like that. It's often called embarrassing the parallel. Um, if you have a thousand variables that you need to run the same analysis on, something along those lines. And the important bit is that all these jobs, they don't have any communication. Between. All the independent parts of the job, they can be done independently. If you could think of a way to write a thousand separate jobs, and submit them all independently in any order um, and get the same results, uh, that's when arrays are useful. So next, let's, let's take a look at an uh, array job example. Um, this, in truth, is a serial job. Uh, there's nothing special about it. The only thing that we have here is that it's got this array, dash dash array one to two. This is essentially saying how many times I want to submit this job at the range so to speak. So I've, I've used one to two, so it's going to submit two serial jobs, two of these, two copies of this job. The difference between these two copies is something, is an environment variable that will appear in each of the jobs. And it's called the Slurm Array Task ID. And that Slurm Array Task ID environment variable will be one of the numbers from the range that we chose in the array um, directive. So in this case, it'll either be a one or a two. 
but only one of them will be one and only one of them will be two. So you can see in the output files at the bottom, they both printed the working directory, but they both also printed out different Solomary task IDs. They go back different Solomary task IDs. One of them echo back one, the other one echo back two. And so what you'll do is you use that iterator in your scripts. And so for example, rather than having a for loop in your script that says for i in one to the length of my, uh, my vector of variables, run the analysis on each of the um, instances in this vector of variables, you'll instead say, run the analysis on the nth variable where n is the Solomon array task ID that I pulled from the environment. And now you'll get a, in, let's say it was an array of a thousand, you'd get a thousand jobs, each with a different Solomon array task ID, each which would pull, pull a different number for the Solomon array task ID into the environment of the script when it starts running, that will then use that number as a different iterator in your vector of variables and run that analysis on a different variable in your vector. And so this means that it's a really convenient way of essentially doing lots and lots of the same thing without having to do an internal for loop in your script and allows you to utilize many, many resources um, at once. So rather than having one really big, really long job that's a for loop that's just cycling through every single iteration, you'll have a thousand really tiny jobs that only do one iteration each, but they're all doing a different iteration. And so that's really useful and really convenient for that type of learning. Uh, a few more expect options that we'll look at here. Um, if you're only a member of one project, you don't need to worry about this, but if you do become a member of more than one project, you will need to specify what project you want your work to be, to be submitted to. And you do that with the um, line dash dash account equals followed by the project code. Each of your jobs will produce an output file. It defaults to being called something like slurm underscore job ID dot out, um, but you can rename them and split them into output and error. And that's what's done here. So dash dash output equals my job underscore percent J. And that percent J refers to the job ID. Make sure you include that somewhere in the name dot out. And for error equals the same except dot error. And so this will split our jobs, output files into two output files, one for the output, one for the error, and rename them to my job underscore job ID dot out and dot error. Uh, you can have your job mail you. So you specify who you want to mail you with and what and when you want it to mail you. So begin, end, error. There are lots of options available. You can find all of these options and more with the command man spatch um, to get the manual page for the spatch. Uh, as I mentioned, you can force a certain amount of tasks into each node. In this case, we use n tasks per node and equals eight, and that will force eight tasks into the node, and then we can specify how many nodes we want. If we do use n tasks per node, we can then go back to using dash dash mem because we know how many tasks are going to be in each node, and we can just if we know how many tasks, we know what scale of memory we require. Uh, if you want to use GPUs, you have to add the line dash dash uh, GPUs per node equals one or two, however many GPUs you want. And finally, there's an extra line, QoS equals debug. And so QoS stands for policy service. And this will impose some restrictions on that job that has that debug QoS. Uh, the restrictions being that you can only have one job with the debug QoS in the queue or running at a time. Can only be a 15 minute or shorter job and you can only use the resources of up to two nodes for that job however that job will have pretty much as high a priority as possible um so as soon as you submit that job as long as the resources is free you start really great for testing and debugging as the name suggests um on top of that we highly advise that before you submit your really large shop so say you've done scaling and you've estimated and you've debugged at the start now you've set up your full-size job before submitting that full-size job and potentially waiting days or weeks, depending on the size of the job for it to start uh, and the state of the queue as well, submit a debug version of that job. So scale it down so it's only asking for two nodes of resources, only asking for 15 minutes. You know it's going to fail with those resources, it doesn't matter. What you're hoping it happens is that it fails after 15 minutes uh, with a timeout error uh, because it's exceedingly common for jobs to fail in the first 15 minutes um, with minor errors because of spelling mistakes or because they forgot to load packages or they a grammatical error, there's a comma in a place where it shouldn't be, any number of other things, these are exceedingly common. And if you're submitting a really big job and you're waiting in the queue for a long time, that's the last thing that you want to see because then you're going to have to submit the job again, having made one change to it, loading one package that you've got to load or getting rid of the comma that's not supposed to be there and wait all over again. And that's just very irritating. <laughs> Software, the platforms have a lot of software already pre-installed. Uh, you can find all the software available on our platform on our supported applications page of our support site, which is uh, support.messy.org.nz. Um, if 
it's not available, um, feel free to either install it yourself. You can do so in either your project or your home directory or your Novak directory if you really want. Um, and if you have any trouble installing it, do contact us and we'll do what I do our best to help you install it uh, if we're able to. We can't guarantee that we can install every software. Um, there are various things we might not be able to install it, um, such as the fact that software has to be Linux, uh, has to have command line capable um, as well to be able to install the platforms. Um, you can, as I mentioned previously, do a bit of visualization interaction type work, um, either using X forwarding on the login nodes or using Jupyter. Uh, license wise, we don't provide the licenses generally. Um, if you want to use a license software, what will happen is that you, your institutional department, will have to set up a license server and we'll work with your IT team to help that out. And then when we'll install the software, and then when you try to use that piece of software, we'll point that software towards the license server that your institutional department or whatever set up. Here are some important environment module related commands. Um, and so I mentioned you can find the supported applications on that support app, all the software on the support application page of the support site. You can also use the following two commands, either module spider followed by the module name or module avail dash s followed by the module name to search the stuff, uh, software available on the platform itself. Uh, unfortunately, module spider only works on Mahawika. And so that's where module avail comes in because that works on both on Maui and Mahawika. Module show gives you more information about the module. Module load will allow you to load uh, the module and module help will give you more uh, information about module commands in general. And so here's an example of a job using environment modules. It's just a serial Python script that's going to print the working directory. Uh, and so we added the extra line, module load Python. And so that will load the latest version of Python you have available. Uh, if you want a specific version of Python or any other piece of software, because we have lots of different versions of lots of different softwares, uh, you just have to add the full version name, uh, which can be found either on the supported applications page or with module spider or module avail. And then you use the specific uh, command for that piece of software. In this case, it's just all lowercase Python. And then uh, here we've used dash C to import a command into Python to run. And that's just going to print the working directory. But generally, you'll have written a script that might be called script.py, for example, which lists all of the commands and everything you want to do in it. And then you'll use Python script.py in a line by line run for everything you've got in that script. So that's a basic script uh, job that uses environment modules. I mentioned a couple of times we have Jupyter available. Uh, Jupyter is a really great uh, tool for interactive computing. It's really convenient, especially for users who are not used to a command line environment. So it's a sort of eases you into it a bit. Uh, and especially for users who are used to using Jupyter notebooks, it's really convenient as well. Um, you can find more in-depth instructions on, on accessing and using Jupyter Notebooks here, but I'll just go over the really basics here. Uh, if you just follow the link there, jupyter.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.nc.org.
Uh, general best practices. Uh, essentially, this boils down to this is a shared resource, a shared environment, and we want to get as much use out of it for everyone as possible and have as many New Zealand researchers uh, do their work as possible. So if you're being very wasteful with the resources you're asked for, asking for, um, those are resources other people can't use. And so um, try to be considerate. Try not to over ask too much for both memory and uh, wall time. It's okay to ask maybe 20% more than you expect to need just to avoid your jobs failing without a memory or timeout error. Do need to be accurate with CPU. There's not really any reason for you to ask for more CPUs than you need. Um, if we do find that you're running work that's either being being very wasteful or hogging the login nodes, um, which are really only there for uh, basic testing and setting up scripts and submitting jobs, we don't want anything computationally intensive there. But if we find you doing either really, really inefficient work or hogging the login nodes, uh, we may kill your jobs or processes. If we do decide to do that, we'll send you an email explaining why we've done it. Um, or we may just contact you and ask about it and say, why are you doing, doing this? Um, but just be advised, be considerate. It's a shared resource. We're trying to help as many people as possible. And if you're being wasteful, those are resources we can't give to someone else. Finally, how to ask a question. Um, if you have any problems, um, do contact us at support at nessie.org.nz or go to support.nessie.org.nz, which is the support page, and you can contact us through there as well. Um, and when you do contact us, please include as much information as you can, um, because we just want to avoid as much as possible having to have back and forth between you or having to search for things and find stuff. We want you to just provide all, all the information we need so that we can look at it, figure out what the problem is, figure out the solution, and then send you how to then resolve it for you. And so if you include as much information as possible, um, we can hopefully resolve your problem faster. So for example, if your job failed, if you include like the things like the job ID, the salon file path, what command or commands are used, and the error message, it'll just make it so much faster for us to help. Finally, I'll mention again, we have our consultant service. Uh, if you think you might be interested, please go to this link here and take a look. Uh, and then if you are interested, contact us at support.nessie.org.nz, support.nessie.org.nz. Um, and we can put you in touch with our consultancy team to discuss whether a consultancy is right for you. Um, we Consultancies are at request, it's not automatic, and it's not guaranteed you'll get one. Um, but if you, uh, especially if you're writing your own code, they could be really, really helpful. Right, and that is the talk. Usually we'd have questions after, but because this is a recording, uh, that's that. If you would like to have attended in person one, or if you'd like to um, ask us some questions, uh, please feel very free to contact us at support at nessie.org.nz. We're happy to set up meetings or just talk over Zoom or talk uh, via emails, anything that you need. Have a good one.